the old Jewish doctrine, can simply be flow into Christianity and be reconciled by whatever means is available. Therefore, as our primary subject this evening deals, at least in part, with the messianic idea, I think we should investigate it somewhat in its own Aramaic setting, in order that we can understand it better. Our word, Messiah, comes from an ancient word meaning the anointed. Therefore, it is a person or a being set aside by a kind of rite, a ceremony. To anoint meant not only uh, to accept into the family of the redeemed, it also meant to bestow a certain kind of destiny. The destiny of continuing a certain way of life. The anointed person was subject to restrictions and rules upon his conduct. If those who were not anointed were not required to maintain. Uh, the Jewish religion in its older time did not have the same concept of a Messiah uh, that we know today. For example, uh, the idea of a personal intercessing power, something to intercede between God and man. The emerging of a purely spiritual savior. These concepts did not belong to the early period of Jewish philosophy or metaphysics. The Messiah to them was a savior of Israel and by extension of non-Israelite people as well. But it was a savior in the sense of a restorer of the temporal power of the Judean king. It involved both the idea of the priest and the king forever, even as in the ancient concept of the Melchizedek. Thus the Messiah of the old Jewish people was a temporal sovereign, one who was to rise up to restore Israel. This temporal sovereign, of course, spoke with the authority of God. He was one raised up by God for the restoration of Israel. His ministry was foreordained and predestined. But he came not primarily as a teacher, but as a king, as a great princely person. He should rule righteously over the tribes of the children of Israel. It also followed that under the rulership of this messianic ruler, Israel would flourish. Peace and tranquility would be upon the land. All men would dwell together in peace and in security and in fraternity. For this wonderful kingdom of the Messiah was in every sense of the word a righteous kingdom. A kingdom in which all good things came to pass and in which the power of evil no longer afflicted the righteous and the God-loving. So with the Messiah came this concept of a temporal golden age, an age unto foreverness, in which the people would go on and on under the wise king and those who came after him. <laughs> his proper and legitimate successor. 
and there would be forever peace upon the world. And the struggles and the sorrows of ancient days would be no more. Now it would obviously follow that speculations along this line would be influenced very largely by conditions through which the Jewish community passed in its rather long and troubled history. And evidence shows that the importance of the Messiah increased whenever the temporal security of Jewry was threatened. The Messiah, therefore, became a hope image. The more terrible the difficulty, the deeper the sorrow, the more desperately the devout clung to their concept that there should rise up among them the Redeemer of their people. Thus we see during the Roman period of domination, not only the rise of Messianic leaders, but even if we may say so, the, the rise of pretenders with the result that a great deal of sorrow and disappointment came into the Jewish religious life. Everywhere men were hoping, and the Messianic leaders could either be of the nature and quality of men like John the Baptizer, all of the prophecies concerning the Messiah are probably in the book of Isaiah. Yet a study of this book shows conclusively that we are not to understand or interpret it as we might one of our own more recent scriptures. The Messiah of Isaiah was a symbol, a being invested with the fulfillment of the need of Israel, a being hearkening to the cry of Israel for the restoration of virtue. Between the suffering of the people and this messianic ultimate, was a dark and troubled period arising from the disobedience of man. The human being, having fallen away from truth and of virtue, having descended into the corruption of life, was therefore deprived of the blessing of the advent of the Messiah King. Two schools of thought arose upon this subject. One was that man himself must mend his own ways, must return to the simple paths of virtue and integrity. And when man lived the life as revealed and given in the Torah, then the Messiah King would come to reward man for the virtues that he had learned to practice from his own need and understanding. The second school was that the Messiah would usher in this better time. The corruption would not end until the Messiah did come. But the hour of this coming no man knoweth, for the mystery rested forever in the divine will. Thus we see two different aspect of one problem, one in which man must earn his salvation, and the other in which salvation must be bestowed, because man himself did not have the power or understanding to achieve this most important and noble of all ends. As time went on, a Jewish mysticism began to mingle extremes with Islamic metaphysics and the rising theology of medieval Europe. We see the Kabbalistic position emerging more and more strongly, which again is a highly mystical or metaphysical tradition. And I think the modern Jew of today 
more or less favors this metaphysical or mystical approach, which is not in substance so very different from that of the modern Christian. The tendency now is to regard the Messiah no longer as a temporal king, no longer a ruler over Judea, although the Zionist movement did emphasize this at one time. And there are still Jewish people who firmly believe that the rebuilding of the temple at Jerusalem is an ethical marker in the development of Jewish history that after the restoration of the temple, the possibility looms large of the restoration of the Judean king. Our way of life, however, more or less changes this perspective. There does not seem to be so much of the old glamour in the idea uh, that uh, the state of Israel may become a full functioning and permanent member of a family of democratic states. The concept of democracy does not lend itself to the legendary and lore of the old house of David. So by degrees these older interpretations are fading out. And the concept today is for the Jew as for the Gentile. Uh, the hope of the rise of a spiritual leader who will restore the integrities and values of man and will lead all men of good hope, good understanding, and good character out of the desert of uncertainty into the promised land of integrity, serenity, peace, and justice. Just by a rather circuitous route, the old ideas have descended to us. And of course, for the majority of believers, the metaphysical aspects of the problem are merely sexually considered. There is not much emphasis upon them because they seem to lead into strange byways which are not productive of immediate good. Yet these metaphysical phases have their own natural importance, not only in religion, but in philosophy and in the modern science of, uh, of psychology. So we want to pause for a little while and examine some of the neglected areas of thinking relating to this very interesting and truly remarkable subject. Among the Jewish people, the highest of all the hierarchs of spiritual beings was the most magnificent angel called Metatron. Metatron was called by some the angel of the faith, others the angel of the presence. Still others regarded Metatron as the herald of the eternal one. He moved forth out of the presence of deity and carried the story of deity and the divine will throughout all the parts of the world. The origin of the angelic being, Metatron, is not very clearly set forth. But there is certainly evidence that this being was known, recognized, regarded, and included in the religious philosophy of Israel, at least as early as the 7th to 10th century B.C. Therefore, it belongs to one of the old beliefs and traditions of the people. Now, there is also a belief current among the older mystics uh, that the origin of the story of Metatron came from the mystery of Enoch, the mysterious one, the prophet of old, the teacher who was permitted to walk with God. The book of Enoch carries some references and intimations of a mystery, but nothing as complete as the problem with which we are concerned tonight. But one thing is interesting. It is said that when Enoch ascended to heaven, and was reunited with the divine power, 
deity caused Enoch to become metatron. Wherefore, that this angel was actually the ancient, rather mystic, mysterious and mystical patriarch Enoch. And later, according to the same account, this angel, Metatron, came to be known as Messiah, or the one who was to bear witness before the world of the will of Israel. And in the same ancient uh, Kabbalah and commentary, it is stated that the soul of Enoch entered into the soul of Jesus, and that therefore Enoch, Messiah, Jesus, Metatron, all of these elements are tied together in one or other phase of the messianic report. It is quite probable that the early writers and commentators on the New Testament were aware of some of these parallels and involvements. It may also quite have been that some beliefs or traditions relating to this were particularly current or held unusual interest at the time of the birth of Jesus, inasmuch as he was born in one of these critical periods in which the messianic concept was uh, pushed forward very heavily by the Jewish people in their great temporal calamity. All of these points cause us then to attempt to go still deeper to see if we can what the basic underlying philosophy bearing upon this problem might well be. Uh, we know that this philosophy will have to be drawn from more than one source, even as old Jewish philosophy was drawn from more than one stream of cultural descent. One of our most helpful uh, contributing sources will be Egypt, where a great deal of the wisdom of the old Jewish people seems to have originated, especially as we are told definitely that Moses was most learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians. Last week we took up the phase of attempting to understand the rise of an anthropomorphic uh, universe, a universe in which two principles or powers held certain sway over the state of existence. The positive and aggressive principle being in this case the power of deity, and the so-called passive principle being the power of law, deity operating through and with law bringing forth creation, so that throughout all structure creation was a lawfulness. We observe in the old Jewish writings a considerable lack of what we might term emotional warmth. The old scriptural writings are very much the idea of the law and its inevitable pressures and meanings. The law is summed up in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. It is also summed up in the powerful concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And down through the involved structure of both the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds, we find Jewish Jewish truth and the legislative phase of Jewish religious philosophy. And in these uh, brackets, we observe the sternness, uh, the, the heavy burden of principles dwelt upon, uh, intensified by study, so that everything becomes a series of precedents about principles or convictions or revelations. And the learned body of the Sanhedrin, sitting in meditation 
upon the Torah, upon the law, listening to the elders, upon the interpretation of the law. This process determined the moral life of Israel. Now it is rather obvious that a people growing up through a series of emotional catastrophes would have certain needs of consciousness which could not be fully expressed in the concept of the eye for an eye and the tooth for a tooth. But there had to be something greater, uh, something by means of which man was bound with a strong tie of friendship to the divine powers that administered his destiny. In the speculations about these things, the being metaphone seems to come forth with a strange and wonderful dignity. We might also mention uh, this other factor that was involved in this, and that was the relationship of the Archangel Michael to the entire mystery of Jewish religious philosophy. Some of the medieval Kabbalists were of the opinion uh, that Michael was a kind of secret god of Israel. That while the populace and the people worshipped at the great altar of the geobestic concept, the learned, the deep, the mystical, the enlightened, recognized the Archangel Michael as the psychopompus, the Lord of Souls, the most powerful and mysterious of all the agencies of heaven. Michael and Metatron were sometimes intermingled, and their various attributes confused. But out of the general confusion, there arose a representation of a secondary power arising in the interval between God and law. But God and law simply were not enough. That between these two there had to be an equilibrating force, a balance set up in space. And that the purpose of this balance was essentially to reconcile the manifested attributes of God and law. In essence and substance, God and law were reconciled. But as soon as law began to manifest, deity correspondingly ceased to manifest. The universe became very largely a manifestation of law, not of God. The oceans and the tides and the regular risings and settings of the sun, these were manifestations of law. And we have a situation in uh, the rise of the early Jewish religion that we also find in India, in China, and even among the Buddhists. Gradually, the primary deity is forced back to an almost unknown estate, almost unrecognized. And in its place comes forth a new concept of deity, a concept closer to men's understanding and contemplation. Now we have, for example, in Christmas, a great many houses of worship. The majority of these houses of worship, however, if you go rather carefully and study them, are not dedicated to God the Father. Most of them are houses of worship dedicated to Christ, or to the Virgin Mary, or to the saints. You will have the Cathedral of St. Andrew. You will have the Church of St. Thomas. You will have the ecclesia of St. John the Baptizer, and you will go down all the way through this list. But on very few of the cornerstones or inscription tablets 
will it say simply, dedicated to God the Father. The paternity of deity sort of disappeared in Christian worship. It disappeared also in Hinduism, where Brahma began to lose prominence and Shiva, or Vishnu, became the principal deity of the pantheon. This is probably due to a phenomenon that you can observe yourself, namely that in your own experience, if you take two processes such as divine will and divine law, and you look around you, or even look within you, you will see many manifestations of divine law. But you will have difficulty in distinguishing or separating manifestations of divine will apart from law. In other words, perhaps simpler words, uh, the inner consciousness processes of God are exceedingly difficult for us to conceive. Whereas the so-called external creative powers of deity, by which worlds are fashioned, by which great processes occur in nature, these come more immediately to our recognition. So we become more aware of deity veiled in laws than we do a deity apart from these laws. In fact, there is some question as to whether we can conceive of deity totally apart from the vestment of processes by which it operates in the, in the procedures of creation. In any event, men gradually seem to feel or to sense a certain difference in their religious insight. Uh, there was a distinct concept of man rising up to assist in the bridging of the interval between deity and creation. Man as a creature sought to know and understand his creator. He found it necessary, therefore, to bridge this incredible interval of quality. He raised up his hands to the heavens, but he did not find the Creator. He found only symbols of sky and light. He saw it within his own nature, but he did not find Creator. He found merely the strange longings and yearnings of his own heart. Everywhere he turned, seeking to find the way to union with his God, he found this way barred by mysterious processes. And of these mysterious processes, perhaps the most dominant and difficult to understand were the very processes of law. He found cause and effect, good and evil, he found the various principles of energy, but he could not bridge this mysterious distance that led him or intervened between him and the conscious experience of the life principle of God. So along the way, he began to experiment with this. And among his own experiments, one of the most simple that he made was the establishment of a priesthood. At a very early time, he recognized that among his own kind, there were some who by their very natures and characters seemed to be set aside for the worship of God. He also realized that there were certain needs for common worship, for assembly, and for the rites and rituals of faith as a means of strengthening or restoring man's remembrance of the spiritual origin of himself. So these religious institutions came into existence, and with them a pious kind of person, an individual who no longer took part in the general activities of life, but who was devoted to prayer and meditation, to the transcription of ancient writings, 
to art to music and to the common public service of the needy. As time went on, this person took on a number of roles. He became the physician, the attorney, the counselor. He served in all capacities to summon need of people, and he did so in the name of God or in the name of the faith of that people. So man had the mystical kind of experience of beholding among his own kind a motion of consciousness toward God, a mysterious motion in which men seem to be striving to break through, to climb some kind of an invisible mountain uh, in the midst of which was hidden the shrine or the sanctuary of the living God. And the old Jewish philosophers were quite certain that this motion was not all in one direction. That men should seek God could only mean one thing in substance and essence. They believed that God was seeking man. But as man moved inward towards a contemplation of reality, there came forth out of God a mystery of compensation. First, we still had a world of law, but the fact that man tried to be better itself set up a motion in law, and law itself required its own fulfillment in the attainment of a more spiritual and wonderful internal mystery. During the process of this internal mystery, Man also began to differentiate the attributes of his own consciousness more than he previously had been able to do. There arose in him, for example, a sensing of the essential difference between mind and emotion. He began to recognize reason, and he also began to recognize love. He was not able to early mature these concepts into a perfect pattern. But he early in our ancient writings we find sheer and clear evidence of this. He early began to sense that in a mysterious way, reason and love had a bearing upon the spiritual destiny of things. He sensed that reason was very close to law. That therefore the philosopher, uh, the wise man, the scholar, and the student uh, could through reason come to understand the operation of universal law. The catch in this was, of course, that this universal law, extending on and on, uh, was so involved and complicated in its procedure that man could scarcely grasp its infinity, even when he possessed faculties suitable to consider it. Also, the attitude of love began to take hold upon man to represent possibly the emotion that he most liked to attribute to deity. He liked to think, therefore, that God and law could also be described as love and reason. He kind of wanted to go with the Greek who held that at the beginning love fashioned all things with the aid of law. So out of the sternness and literalness of a very primitive revelation came the gradual recognition that deity was a being possessing rational powers, possessing emotional powers, and possessing also physical attributes. And the physical attributes might be energy. The physical attributes might be those activities which are manifested in the processes of creation. But behind these activities are other forces constantly operating one of which is reason. Things must have their reasonableness. 
and what is love, or the spontaneous emotional sense of value. The old patriarch uh, in his tent in the desert was somewhere along the line torn between love and duty. He was torn between the law and his own personal emotional regard. We find this clearly stated in the uh, sorrows of David, king of Israel, and of his illustrious son, Solomon. We find in all the stories of the old patriarchs and the, and the ancient prophets, uh, this conflict gradually taking shape, the conflict between the heart which wished to forgive and the law which wished to retain its absolute immutable consistency. And gradually the public mind, which must be the interpreter of faith, came to the realization or came to the acceptance that love was equal to law, and that love had about it something that was lawful. Love was not a violation of law. Love was a fulfillment of law upon a level higher than justice. Also in love were the qualities of true parental emotion, or parental thoughtfulness, or care. And uh, in this relationship we see the gradual civilizing of religion. For at various times in all parts of the world we have seen deity suddenly warmed up or becoming toned or colored by the tremendous pressure of the, of the emotional maturing of people. So that the old gods, sitting quietly upon their stone thrones, gradually vanished from our spiritual experience. And in their places were deities of participation, deities who were said as near, deities who understood, most of all, deities who were patient with the weaknesses of men. This arises in the contemplation of the old rabbis. And out of this entire procedure undoubtedly came forth the messianic concept. The concept that was created, as one old scholar said, by this one simple problem, or one simple thought. Man observing some vast operation of nature says in his own heart, if I was doing this, I would do it more kindly, more gently. I would not punish men this way. I would realize their frailties and forgive them and give them another chance. And very often we find in religion, even today, people who have outgrown their faith. Their own personal understanding is bigger than their doctrine. And everywhere along the line of religious life, this has happened. And wherever it has happened, there has gradually come into religion new elements and new factors and new values. So the old doctrine became primarily, in almost every so-called advanced color, a culture, a Trinitarian doctrine, a doctrine of three powers forming deity, not simply one power. These three powers were considered to be will, or the divine a agent of creation, wisdom, the process of creation, and activity, the transformation of creation to matter, and the gradual extension of the material diffusion of life. So will, wisdom, and action, or consciousness, intelligence, and force, or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or wisdom, love, and action. These different polarities were sensed in the divine nature. 
Out of this came gradually the Christian concept, the doctrine of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The three persons, one person. Three aspects of one power. But these aspects necessary because man had discovered and differentiated their influences in his own conduct. Therefore, they could no longer be denied to the conduct of universal power. See, the Creator is then rounded in his own concept and in man's concepts of him. He not only fashions, uh, thus bestowing his life upon creation, but he becomes the truly human parent, who also becomes the continual protector of that which he has created, providing in space not merely a furrow in the ground into which seed is cast, but a home in which all the elements of a moral society are envisioned as existing. Out of this new relationship, therefore, comes the loving Father, the protecting Father, the Father who forgives, the Father who relents, the Father who is not merely a God of justice but of mercy, a deity in whom in whose nature all the weaknesses and imperfections of man's uh, constitution are experienced or known. For whereas man may not know God, God by virtue of its own divinity may and does know man. And it's the power of the superior to know the inferior, which as Buddha points out, causes the superior always to assume a full paternity an attitude of greater understanding and greater love and patience. So in this situation, uh, the ancient mystical concept was that out of the spiritual experience of deity and out of the spiritual experience of man searching upward, uh, a miracle of circumstance occurred. Man rising from his own ignorance and searching further and further into himself and into space in quest of spiritual consolation sought to create some form of bridge between himself and the invisible. This bridge was his own rising psychic nature. This bridge uh, balance the mystery of spirit and body, or of God and law. Because now in this interval was placed a mediator, a common ground which partook of both the superior and the inferior. At the same time there rose in the divine nature also this spirit of mediation. This spirit which could not manifest in man if it was not already in the power which created man. Therefore, if man can seek a fuller and more sympathetic understanding of life, it is only because he has been endowed with faculties which make this possible. These faculties rise also in the divine nature. So in the nature of deity, there came the mysterious power by which it began to understand man. But the relation was no longer that of a king and his people. But the king put upon himself a disguise and went forth as did Solomon to wander the streets of his city to know how his people lived. In other words, the divine autocrat began to disappear, much as in the case of Akhenaten in Egypt. And the king, as the responsible leader of his people, the king is parent, the god king, as father, began to take clear shape 
to the formation of religious convictions. To do this, therefore, deity had to gain this mysterious awareness. And it is said in the ancient writings to exceedingly said, deity took flesh and dwelt among us. Now you'll find the Greeks anticipated this process also. For in their legend, whenever the deities are in need of information, they come down to earth, take upon themselves mortal forms, wander unknown among men. The same was true in the ancient Nordic and Gothic rites. And it is believed in India today that some lowly mendicant you meet along the roadside may be the deity Shiva, still wandering the earth to test the souls of men. So in the old belief, this supreme sovereignty projected from itself attributes or aspects of its own nature. These became embodied for the purpose of exploring into the psychic mystery of human life. Just as surely as we, under some conditions, may search in a foreign land to find out how other people live, and having discovered the truth, become very much concerned with this discovery and try to solve the problems that beset others. So in the ancient belief it was held, the deity became more and more mindful of its people, just in the same ratio as the people became more mindful of deity. And out of this mutual mindfulness, there was built the world soul, which was the mindfulness of God, and the human soul, which was the mindfulness of man after God. Now this point is rather intriguing because it would indicate that the structure of the soul might be subject to further analysis. The soul actually represents, therefore, a reaching, a reaching out toward something necessary. It is a reaching out to experience something, and the very substance of soul is therefore its experience capacity. The soul of deity, the universal soul, is reaching downward into the mystery of the abyss, of that which is unknown. The human soul is reaching upward into the mystery of space, of that which is not known. All material things seem to be reaching out toward the mystery of eternity. All spiritual things seem to be converging upon man himself, as though there would sometime be a strange and wonderful mingling of these two vast motions of life existence. There is no doubt in the world uh, that gradually the personification of the mysterious soul process was the basis of the messianic concept. We find this also in medieval Europe among the Christian mystics at the time of the rise of alchemy. We know that the alchemical researches and speculations the strange, fantastic accounts of the gold makers. The these were primarily explorations of psychic life, the discovery of the soul power. And in all instances, the stone or the mysterious elixir of life, the universal medicine, the agent of transmutation of base metals into gold. This mysterious agent was nearly always symbolized under the likeness of Christ. And it was believed that the life of Christ was the perfect textbook for the regeneration of metals. This psychic mystery, therefore, did tie very definitely into a concept of regeneration 
centered upon the existence of a messianic power or a third balancing factor between the two great opposites. Pythagoras points out this definite point when he insists that the primary numbers arrayed against each other, the one and the two, could only be brought into equilibrium by the three. That the one represented God, the two represented matter or law, and the three represented man or soul. Therefore, that man actually, because of his unique position in nature, is the embodiment of this psychic middle distance. That man is born a living soul. That as a soul, he is an inhabitor of a middle land called Midgard in the old writings. That man, therefore, has as his own nature and proper birthright the power to exist in a material state by virtue of body. And also he has the birthright to live in a supermaterial state or a divine state by birthright of the spirit within his own nature. In man, spirit and body are also linked by the compound substance of mind emotion or the psychic vehicle. Man is therefore as much a part of the trinity as the other parts. For God is truly the embodiment of spirit. The universe is truly under the laws governing matter and man is under the integration which we call soul. And the three parts of creation are spirit, body, and soul. And man is the peculiar, mysterious symbol of soul in the Western philosophies, just as in the flower arrangement of Oriental uh, mysticism. So being the soul of itself, Man represents two things. He represents the psychic rising of his own nature, and he also represents the psychic diffusion of the universal soul in space. Thus, in the old Hebrew speculations, of the Kabbalah particularly, the Messiah is man. Yes, the Messiah has the number of the man. For the Messiah is the number of Shaddai, which is the great, the most powerful, the number of man. Man, therefore, is the eternal symbol of the eternal soul power in space. And man attaining to his full dignity becomes the living soul which binds heaven and earth. Man, therefore, not only visibly but invisibly, is the psychic bridge between God and nature. The psychic bridge between will and law. The psychic power or bridge between creator and creation. This important discovery had a profound influence upon the ancient mystics. For if this Messiah, therefore, represented a soul power available both in man and in nature, it naturally followed that the root of this messianic principle was in deity, in the heart of God. And the manifestation of this power in the story of human activity was in the heart of man. So that which arose in deity as archetype becomes manifested in man as fact or as circumstance moving into conduct. It would then naturally also follow that man passed from an old dispensation to a new dispensation. He passed from the dispensation of will law or the ancient concept of the Creator and the Creator's retributional power, and passed into a new relationship with existence, 
in which he becomes, so to say, the firstborn of life and law. Not only is he thus the reasonable and proper child of heaven and earth, as in the Chinese philosophy, but he is the heir to heaven and earth, according to certain of the old Christian mystical traditions. The Messiah, consequently, is both the Son of God and the Son of Man. The Messiah as the Son of God is the deity psychic integration. The Messiah as the Son of Man is to the human being's psychic integration. These are interrelated, but they form on both levels the bridge, the link. They form the connection between cause and effect. They form the middle ground across which one nature may pass to the consideration of the other. Therefore, the saving of man, the salvation of man, is always represented by the patriarchs, the prophets, or the messianic beings that have come from God. And the power which emerges from deity is its own archetypal psychic entity. Uh, the uh, this concept of this also uh, shows itself in the idea of the kingdom. From the kingdom of this world, which is the mortal kingdom of the Judean kings, there comes the idea of another kind of kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. There is an invisible world, and in this invisible world there is also the great city of God, as St. Augustine describes. And over this city of God, the Lamb and the Light rule supreme. There is an inner world and an outer world. The outer world is essentially the world of body. The inner world is the world of soul or psychic life. Beyond this is the world of spirit. But it is only over the bridge that we can attain to this other land which is much like your pure land sect in your northern Buddhistic doctrine. And as the Bodhisattvas stand as the embodiments of human beings who have been redeemed and have become in turn the redeemers of other men, so actually the saviors of the world are the sole power of man which revealed and directed becomes the intermediary between heaven and earth. This sole power is Metatron, the angel of the presence. This is the psychic integration, this powerful so-called prince of the face. For when man gazes upon the face of deity, he sees not the face, but the angel of the face. He sees not the face of God, which is invisible but the vast psychic face of the moral world, of the world with its real spiritual attributes, as visible as qualities, but we cannot pierce the veil into that which is at the root of quality and remains forever invisible to us. Now the